webinar presentation. My name is Katie Parrish, Editorial Director of MCM Group, and your host for today's conference. If you have follow-up questions, comments, ideas, or suggestions after today's event or for future webinars, please feel free to contact me at the phone number or email address on the screen. MCM Group would like to extend a special thank you to today's sponsor, CM Lab. For over 15 years, CM Lab Simulations has been delivering Vortex solutions for simulation-based crane and heavy equipment training. Vortex simulators train operators to properly handle machines and loads in simulated work sites that replicate actual settings and hazards. Everyday operators, soldiers, engineers, and drivers are trained on Vortex solutions at over 1,000 installations worldwide. All CM Lab business processes are ISO certified. For more information, visit cm-labs.com. Today's training organizations and equipment operators are getting real results with simulation-based training. Today you'll hear from industry leaders during this presentation on how they deploy simulators to assess and build real skills. Your agenda today will include a discussion of simulation training myths and truths presented by Paolo Paletta, Industry Solutions Manager for CM Lab Simulation, following Paolo. Jim Headley and Bill Schofield of Crane Institute of America will talk about using crane simulators to build operator skills. Then Steve Fryer of NCSG Crane and Heavy Hall will discuss training and competence in the 21st century. At the end of the webinar, we will hold a question and answer session. If you have questions for our presenters, please type them in the question box on your screen. We will answer them at the end of the, at the end of the webinar. Additionally, this presentation will be recorded and can be accessed this week on safetyconference.com and the MCM Group YouTube channel or the Crane Hotline website. Addresses for both will be shown again at the end of the presentation. Also, portions of this webinar will be interactive, and we want to hear from you. At a few points during the webinar, we will be polling you for your opinion on a number of questions. So please look for those to pop up uh, during the presentation. It should look like that. I'm going to pass the control over to Paolo, and uh, when you're ready, you can get started. Close quarters here. Let's okay, thank you, uh, Katie, for the uh, the introduction. Um, so, um, most of you are probably familiar with uh, training simulators, training simulators, but perhaps have some doubts as to their effectiveness. So, before we meet our distinguished speakers, I'd like to spend a couple of minutes debunking some uh, common myths that surround the use of simulators for training. So, myth number one: it's just a game. Uh, we hear this uh, now and then. People who are unfamiliar with the technology sometimes say it, but today simulators can truly replicate the real behaviors of cranes and heavy equipment. Simulators are capable of highly realistic rigging, cable, load, and soil dynamics. With this, they offer real-world training and can provide the objective criteria needed to fairly evaluate operators. So today, simulators are not games. They are, in fact, some pretty serious uh, learning tools. Let's, uh, take, let's take a quick look at a well-established example. In the airline industry, uh, pilots take responsibility not only for complex and expensive equipment, but also for lives. Simulators can train pilots for non-typical events like machine failures and water landings. Pilots even clock time in a simulator that goes towards maintaining their actual uh, pilot certifications. The same can apply to crane operators. They're responsible for very expensive equipment, as most of you know, and they play a critical role in the safety of everyone on the job site. In a simulator, operators can train to deal with non-typical events such as sinking outriggers, broken slings, unexpected weather, and other machine failures and worksite hazards. Operator performance is critical to both safety and operating profit, and experience in a simulator can address safety challenges and performance issues that could otherwise lead to production loss, poor quality work, or schedule delays. In many industries, simulation-based training has been shown to lead uh, to proficiency in less time. For example, a study recently published in Chief Learning Officer magazine determined that it, pilot training programs that used simulators led to similar levels of proficiency in 13.6% less time than uh, equivalent programs that did not use simulators for training. So similar type of results were found in medical training, equipment maintenance training, truck driver training as well. So it's no longer just a game. Operator training simulators are becoming a primary tool for systematically addressing operator competency. 
And if you haven't thought of integrating simulators into your training program yet, you will be left behind. Myth number two, it doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel like the real thing. It may not be the real thing, and it's not meant to replace the real thing, but simulators have reached a level of realism that makes them an indispensable component of a complete and modern training program. Any machinery can be simulated from drill rigs, concrete pumps, mobile cranes, tower cranes, locomotive cranes, overhead cranes, and many, many more. <coughs> simulators can reproduce potentially hazardous situations, which you could never do on a real crane, for example, working around power lines. Any weather condition can be simulated, such as snow, rain, wind in any direction, constant wind, gusts of wind, moving clouds, fog. It can even change the position of the sun and the sky, which will impact uh, projected shadows. You can even train the entire lift team with integrated signaler training and tandem lift capabilities using two integrated simulators. Hmm. Okay. Simulators can be integrated to actual crane cabs, crane controls, LMIs, and crane computers. The more advanced simulators use high-fidelity physics engines. This is a piece of software that can accurately replicate things like pendulum swing, boom flex, engine torque, and more. This ensures that simulator seat time results in real operator skills and not just controls familiarization. Mm -hmm. Motion platforms also add realism to the learning experience and allow students to feel the crane by the seat of their pants, as they do in the real world. So with today's computer technology, simulators can offer an extremely realistic learning experience. <laughs> Myth number three, they're expensive. Well, if you consider the potential return on investment that simulators enable, the true <laughs> cost of using simulators are minimal, in fact. Firstly, simulators are available for all budgets, from desktop systems for the classroom to, full, to immersive full mission simulators. Simulator, simulators allow you to cut time from real machines, so they effectively lower fuel costs and reduce wear and tear on expensive equipment. Plus, for companies such as crane rental and lift companies, you'll be able to keep your fleet in production while operators train on the simulator. So in addition to fuel cost savings, simulators can also free up instructors to focus on other higher value added tasks because trainees can work their way through simulation exercises at their own pace and on their own. So to, to wrap this up, consider that as an integral part of a complete training program, simulators can produce safer, more effective operators who will further reduce your costs by having less accidents and lifting more efficiently. So with that, Katie, we can trigger our first uh, poll. Okay, let me unmute myself and uh, we'll get the poll started here. Mm -hmm. All right. We're going to launch the first one. So you should see that on your screen. It's a blue screen. And our first question is, what objections do you see around using simulation-based training in your organization? You should be able to answer the poll on the right-hand side. We're going to keep this open for about 30 or 60 seconds. And I see some results coming through. God, I'm glad this is working. This is the first time we've done a poll. So uh, if you've been with us on a few other webinars, um, it's a new feature for us. All right, we'll keep it open for about 20 more seconds. All right, folks, last chance to vote. And then I will uh, close the poll, and we'll see the results. Oops. Can you see those? <laughs> okay, they should be on the screen now. So uh, interesting result then. So the uh, the biggest objection is the uh, cost is, is uh, too high. And just to reiterate uh, what I mentioned in uh, one of my uh, one of my uh, myth uh, slides, um, you know there are simulators for all budgets, from desktop simulators to immersive simulators. And if we look at the long term return on the investment in simulators, uh, the costs do become significantly uh, significantly reduced. Great. And I okay. With that said. We'll pass that on to Jim Headley. He's our next presenter. 
Uh, he's sitting in with uh, Bill Schofield, and I'm going to pass the controls over that way. Hopefully it goes live. Oops. Well, we're still uh, trying to figure out how to uh, get this, so it looks like we're getting there. Are you seeing our slides? Not yet. Oh. You are the presenter, though. Um, I'm not seeing the screen I saw the other day. <laughs> That's... Oh, okay. Sorry. Okay. There you go. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and I should be able to hit the right. The right one or the left? No, here at the right. Okay. Okay. Uh, welcome, everyone. I'm uh, Jim Headley, and uh, <clears throat> I'm a little hoarse today. We've had uh, quite a swing in the weather and the temperatures, and I am uh, currently in a very cool 68 degrees in the greater Orlando, Florida area, and I guess it was about 80 or 90 a couple of days ago. But um, appreciate everyone uh, attending, and I guess this is, uh, hit the right one? Okay, I'm sorry. Okay. Well, hold on. We'll get this going just a second. Uh, okay. Okay. Can you can't so I can read the whole slide? I don't know whether I can. Part of the slide is um, not visible to us, but um, um, I think I can go on without it. Um, Okay, I can do this. Okay, okay. just a little about the Crane Institute. Uh, we would like to think of ourselves as the, uh, the leading provider of training services to the industry. Um, we started in 1987 and we've had um, over 100,000 uh, equipment uh, primarily crane operators, inspectors, supervisors, trainers, riggers, and other safety personnel. And um, our uh, training and certification and books and other products uh, meet and normally exceed all the OSHA and the industry requirements. And we strive to make the lifting industry one of the safest and liability-free um, workplaces. Uh, can <clears throat> well, we're missing a slide here. So, okay. Um, and we do uh, accident investigation and litigation support. In fact. I personally have uh, in get investigated uh, over 300 major crane and rigging accidents and have testified a number of times in, in court. And as you know, in the U.S., uh, it's very litigious down here, probably more so than in uh, Canada. But we do site safety assessments and audits, audits of policies and uh, procedures and we do consulting uh, regarding the uh, ASME ANSI standards and the Canadian standards as well. And in doing that, we, uh, we uh, provide interpretation and application of those standards. And we have um, a large array of uh, products, uh, pro our, our mobile crane handbooks titled these are two individual books, one called Mobile Cranes and the other one called Rigging, are sold um, uh, internationally and we just uh, published both of those books in the uh, metric ver version and uh, we go through about 60,000 of those books uh, every year. What's going on? I don't understand why we're skipping. All right, we're there. Okay, oh, we were just skipping a slide uh, here. Um, 
But anyway, we uh, we're talking about cranes primarily. They they are actually involved in more serious accidents than any other type of construction equipment. They uh, are most costly in terms of insurance claims, and there are more uh, fatalities resulting from cranes and hoisting equipment than uh, any other cause. We skipped again. We apologize for this. Yeah. We seem to be uh, skipping slides and here. Ah, there we go. Um, we'll get into the meat of this. Um, you know, actually, uh, uh, it really it's all about uh, the. Uh, it's all about uh, preventing accidents. That's the most important thing. And in crane operation, uh, judging uh, distances um, and being able to control the load, uh, both actually judging distances uh, goes along with uh, plays a, as a major factor in controlling the load. Uh, they are key, along with uh, other elements such as inspection and crane setup on different. Uh, surfaces. Um, the most important factor in preventing accidents is ensuring that the cranes are supervised and operated by trained and qualified uh, personnel. Now there's some uh, fundamental fundamental hazards uh, associated with cranes. We we talk about this a lot in our training programs and I think this is pretty interesting. Um, why do they present such an inherent risk? Well, cranes are very large and powerful compared to a human being, <clears throat> number one. And uh, all loads are heavy. In fact, uh, if a hundred pounds is dropped, uh, hundred pounds is dropped ten feet, turns into a thousand pounds. And to uh, maintain control of the equipment, uh, you have to account for a large number of variables, which include uh, <clears throat> different uh, capacities uh, because of different boom lengths and radii and boom angles. And you have different terrain that you're set up on, and you could be in the our power lines could be present. Wind affects cranes by blowing on the boom itself and the load. And so uh, there are a lot, uh, we would like to say, there's a lot of bases that, that, um, that you have to cover. But cranes, by their very nature, defy the law of gravity. And they do it in close proximity to people. And when you add all of these variables, um, then you have a lot of risk. And if you can simulate this risk, then you eliminate uh, a lot of the risk and the cost and the time uh, required to train new operators. Now, we've used uh, simulators for crane operators for nearly 15 years. And the Vortex simulator that we currently have is used as a learning tool for students who are completing classroom instruction, but, but who, uh, who haven't yet progressed to working with the crane. And added to that, uh, we not only use it for those personnel, but uh, we use it for uh, people that are currently operating cranes and um, just need some adjustments or need some of the uh, the rough edges to uh, be knocked off of their um, their operating skills. Um, this is pretty interesting here. <clears throat> we start off in the classroom and we cover you know the theory <clears throat> safe operating procedures standards regulations um, how to interpret load charts actually our classes um, 
uh, a lot of time is spent on the interpretation of uh, load charts, and we cover some basic rigging. I'm just talking about our operator classes. But uh, the classroom is safe, it's controlled, it's enclosed, and it's, it's, it's a comfort, comfort zone. Then we, uh, we take them um, intermediately uh, uh, when they're in the classroom and we put them on the uh, simulator. And, um, and like I said before, it's for novice people, experienced people, and they're able to practice and hone their skills. And, you know, actually it does build a lot of uh, confidence and um, it gives them um, a lot of comfort. Um, and, you know, a lot of times when, when they come in, they see the cranes parked outside, you know, you can tell that they, you know, they tense up and they get a little nervous. And we're able to test them, assess their skills on the simulator. And then we take them from there and we put them uh, on the... Uh, on the real equipment. We have three different cranes here and um, depending on the type crane that uh, they'll be operating back on the job site, uh, well, that will do, um, um, depends on how much time they spend on what individual crane that we have here. Now one of the things that simulation does is it um, it bridges the gap. It reduces the time that it takes for a person to go from the classroom and get to the place that um, he can operate the crane in the real world where it's full of, um, of real experiences. As uh, those of you that, that are listening uh, that have operated cranes are well, well aware of. So that's that's, um, they've started off in a real comfortable, uh, risk-free environment, and uh, they learned a number of things uh, on the simulator that they, will, uh, um, that they will have to do on the real crane, and now they're out on the real crane. And this, this really does drastically reduce the time uh, that it takes for a person to um, become experienced enough uh, to be allowed to operate uh, the crane and the, uh, on, the, on, the, on the real job site. <clears throat> now, this is, um, this is something that, um, that uh, we're really facing, um, uh, this workforce shortage is um, uh, it's just a real problem in the U.S. and I think that it probably is a problem um, elsewhere uh, as well and um, and that's a shortage of uh, tradespeople and um, crane operators is, uh, is one of the main uh, shortages. Um, you know just to inject a little something, I'm a baby boomer and um, you know, my father jumped into Normandy in um, in World War II and and survived. Thank thank goodness, or I wouldn't be here today. And um, they worked real hard, and of course they instilled that. Um, you know, I'm from Alabama originally, and um, from a blue collar neighborhood, and. We were real proud of being hard workers. So I entered the workforce um, as a blue collar worker, and I really don't like the word. Um, I don't like to use the color of collars, but you understand, you know, what I'm talking about. Um, and um, and then I went to a technical institute to be a tool and die maker, and um, and then later, um, um, you know, some. In a short time later, I got in the Operating Engineers Union and went through the apprenticeship program and came, became a German crane operator. And I was just trying to make a living and uh, finished the tool and die and stayed with the cranes. And then a few years later, I started the college. And after six and a half years, I, uh, I uh, got a degree in education and then um, um, you know started the Crane Institute, like I, like, like I said before. And, uh, 
1987. But um, my generation has um, uh, inaccurately um, put too much emphasis on going to college. And um, for some reason, there's a, just a mental at attitude out there that um, that working with your hands and being blue collar um, um, is not something that they want to aspire to do. So I think that's one of the reasons that we're having this uh, this shortage. But I think things are changing, and I think attitudes are changing. But um, um, I think that simulation is going to play a big part in um, in exposing people to um, to really how exciting it can be to be a uh, and how challenging it can be to be a, a crane operator. Um, here's some of the practical things regarding uh, <clears throat> how simulation has helped us. Uh, the student, uh, before he gets on a real crane, he already knows the functions of the crane. And he knows uh, how to program the computer before he gets on the crane. And so he is therefore able to more quickly acquire, require, acquire the skills that's necessarily, that, that's necessarily necessary to safely and aptly operate the crane and move loads uh, more quickly. Um, and um, you know, moving loads and operating the crane at, a, is, um, at an adequate speed is, um, is something that's required. You know, time is money. Uh, another um, aspect um, of simulation is that um, a student um, can make mistakes without the fear of an accident or um, the fear of damaging uh, the equipment. And trainees can uh, practice difficult maneuvers in a safe environment. And a safer environment equals lower stress for the student, the trainer, the employer, and faster learning. Another thing that simulation does is it gives a uh, quantitative measurement of the, of the uh, performance um, for load control, collision avoidance, overloads, operating your power, power lines, et cetera. Um, let me just um, stop and spend just a moment on on this load control. I think that simulation for us at the Crane Institute, um, the major thing it does, as I said before, uh, people learn the controls, they learn how to program the computer, but um, you know, a, a mobile crane is designed to uh, lift loads and move loads. It's a pendulum. And so once you get the crane, do, do your uh, walk around or your daily or pre-op or pre-shift inspection, and uh, you get the crane set up properly, get it level with the outriggers out, um, if you have outriggers, and you're, uh, you're getting ready to operate the crane. And this is what it's all about. It's about being able to control the load. And it's a pendulum. And so uh, uh, it looks easy, but it's not easy. It takes, uh, it takes skill to be able to do that. Uh, but that's the main, uh, that's how that, uh, that's how operators will be judged out on the work out in the workplace, it's how they uh, control the load. In other words, they may not understand anything about assessments. They um, may not um, uh, have any interest in whether the operator passed written exams. 
but um, um, and they may not know anything about any of that, but if he cannot control the load, they're not going to consider him qualified to operate the crane, and they're, uh, they're going to think that he presents a uh, hazard to the workers, and, and he does. So simulation um, helps, uh, helps us teach the student uh, the principles um, and the procedures that he has to go through to, uh, to be able to control the load. That's uh, really the main thing that uh, we use it for here. And also it provides a higher degree of documentation in a highly litigious society such as we have here in the U.S. Uh, in other words, um, the employer, if he sends people here at the Korean Institute, then he has documentation not only that the student went to the class and had hands-on training, but he also had, he had training on the uh, um, the simulator, and it is a it provides a database of uh, operator performance to benchmark uh, future students. So that would conclude uh, what I would have to say um, about how we at the Korean Institute of America use uh, the Vortex simulator. Very good. Um, thanks, Jim. I'm going to go to poll question number two, and it is on how do you currently assess operator competency? Um, if you guys could take a few seconds to read the answers and uh, vote. We'll leave it open for a few minutes, uh, 30 more seconds. Uh, we're, having, we're having a little problem with the slides here, um, but I'm going to uh, let Bill Schofield, he, uh, he's uh, over our training and our, uh, our trainers here, and I'm going to let him answer, um, or I'm going to let him speak to that if, he, uh, if you need uh, that to be spoken to. Sure. Um, five seconds, and I'll close this poll, and then you, you, all, you guys will see the results, and uh, uh, you can make some comment on it. All right, those are the results from the uh, folks sitting in. So in-house in evaluation by trainer supervisor seems to be the most uh, common form here of, of uh, the common form of, of assessing operator competency, and this actually leads quite nicely into uh, Steve Fryer's uh, talk, who's uh, going to uh, discuss how he's actually using simulators for more effective uh, assessment of uh, operator competency. It's Perfect. interesting to note that uh, almost half the people um, either accept the, the ticket as a proof of competency or don't perform competency assessments. True, true. All right, Steve, I'm passing the controls over to you, and uh, you can get started whenever you're ready. Okay, you should be able to see my screen now. Is that correct? Yes. You're all good. Okay. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Steve Fryer. I'm the manager of training for NCSG Crane and Heavy Hall. Uh, we have a fleet of over 300 cranes uh, with over 100 different makes and models, ranging from 8 tons up to 1,350 tons. We also have uh, over 200 operators, ranging from first-year apprentices to boom truck operators to mobile crane operators. Um, NCSG services customers stretching all the way from the Arctic Circle of northern Canada right down to the Gulf of uh, the Gulf Coast in the United States. We have a pretty large area and a large number of operators, and that number can range anywhere from 120 operators to over 200 operators, depending on the projects or the shutdowns we have going on. Uh, this is sort of a sample of some of our equipment that we have. So you can see we've got big crawlers, we've got truck mounts, we've got uh, large AT cranes. Uh, the one on the bottom left there is the LTM 11200, which is the world's largest mobile hydraulic crane. So we don't always have the luxury during the shutdown to perform initial assessments in our yard in a safe environment. The crane is usually set up in a live plant, and we may have 100 new operators being assessed in as little as a week. 
Um, so in the past, what we would do is we would have to bring them in in a measured amount. They'd have to go through their entire orientation and the site orientation before we could do an assessment on them because the cranes were already stationed and ready to go, go to work. So we may not find out until the guy's actually sitting in the seat of the crane in a live plant that the guy does not have the skill sets required to perform the task, in which case we start shuffling people around to put them in a uh, less hazardous spot or maybe they might just sit on, in, in the lunchroom for, for the shutdown, um, shifting them from uh, crane to crane to try and avoid having this become a problem. So it's obviously not the optimal way to be able to assess crane operators out in the field in a live environment. Uh, so what we do have is we have checklists that allow us to go through and um, and test people. But these are very yes and no questions and answers. So did they set up the crane level? Yes or no. Uh, was the pin in the hole? Yes or no. Was the correct configuration chosen in the LMI? Yes or no. So it's very easy for us to go through and find out whether they physically understand uh, the machine itself and how it operates, but it doesn't do anything to address their skill sets, whether they can handle a long boom in a tight configuration, uh, working in a very narrow area, or maybe we have to have them in the lay down. So we need to come up with a, a method of being able to assess these skill sets outside of doing this. So the operational skill of actually moving a three-dimensional object through space is not easily defined and results quickly become subjective. Uh, so if the supervisor has a high level of expertise, he's like, likely to rate a worker to his own level. So if I'm very good at what I do and I watch you, I may not rate you as highly. Whereas if I'm relatively new to this method of assessing people and my skill sets aren't quite as high, I may think you're a much better person. So we did a little experiment. We sent out a spreadsheet about five years ago asking all of our supervisors and managers to rate each of our crane operators on five different criteria. And what we got back was basically junk, because one guy would rate the same operator a five, while another manager would rate him a nine. So it didn't really mean anything. It was way too subjective. Uh, so if we test one operator on a hydraulic crane with short boom in the summer, how can that be compared with a guy with a lattice boom, um, long boom in the wintertime? How about wind? There's all kinds of things. We cannot make it an objective test every single time because the parameters will be different every single time. So we had to start looking for a solution to come up with an, a, a, a consistent way of objectively assessing our crane operators. So simulation was a very strong uh, evidence that simulators were the only way to remove subjectivity from the process. I mean, nobody flies a space shuttle without doing hundreds and thousands of hours uh, and a simulator before they get to do it. And we researched several different top-end crane simulators and came to a unanimous decision that uh, Vortex and CM Labs was definitely the way to go. So we purchased what we think is the best uh, simulator on the market. Here's a, a look at what our training platform looks like. So it's on a 40-foot CCAM with a classroom. It's fully self-contained. It has its own generator, or we can plug into whatever power is available when we get there. And it's definitely the go-anywhere solution for a company with holdings across uh, the bulk of North America. So from a training perspective for our apprentices and journeymen, the, the simulator is a valuable tool to speed up the process and ensure good habits are developed early. But today I want to discuss it as an evaluated tool. So what to measure? Speed. Everyone in our industry knows that we want to be able to perform safely, quickly, and efficiently. So being fast doesn't necessarily mean being unsafe. And being slow doesn't guarantee being safe. So if our competition gets it done in half the time, just as safely, we're not going to stay in business for very long. So we need to measure speed. Pendulums. Uh, we were talking about that on the last uh, uh, talk here. And pendulums are bad, right? Well, not necessarily. If an operator can control the pendulum in a second or less, they're still in control of the load. If it takes more than a few seconds to control it, they're not. And it becomes very subjective and hard for a human to judge consistently whether or not you're um, you're controlling those those pendulums, and how do we measure that? Um, if I give you a scale of one to five, you may think the guy's in really good control, and I may think he's not. This takes it out. We can actually measure how the pendulums are and how long they last. So collisions. Obviously, this crane here, if that nacelle makes contact with the boom in the process of doing this lift, we're going to have a catastrophic failure, and that's not a good thing. Um, so collisions are definitely bad. Sorry, I think I went to, okay. 
So alarms may sound for a variety of reasons. Either an operator failed to notice they were boomed up too high or they made contact with the anti-tube lock or they reached an overload condition in the crane. Now, in our industry, we would treat that as a near miss because if it wasn't for the safety device being deployed, we could have had an incident. The boom could have gone over backwards. We could have damaged the, the tip shivs. We could have lost the blocker ball. So those are all very, very important that we measure whether or not those alarms happen. Uh, and then the data, so how do we measure it? Well, we started putting together uh, a little uh, checklist that we could go through. And every employee went through, we would have a specific scenario that they would be measured on. And then we would put down the time that was elapsed, that comes right off the screen. Um, the pendulums, the number of pendulums, the amount of time that it took so we could come up with an average. Uh, the number of alarms and how long they stayed in alarm. And then collisions, whether they were light, medium, or serious. Uh, so if you look at the speed, we decided to look at, look at a score of 100 as a perfect score. So we went through and had some of our best people do these um, different scenarios, and we found that one scenario in particular, we could have a successful person do it in just over eight minutes. So therefore, a, scare, a score of zero to 10 minutes would receive a 100. And then the score would drop by 10 for every four minutes. So if you uh, had a score of 50 for getting it done in 30 minutes and a score of zero for taking 50 minutes to do what a good operator can do in eight. So that allows us to measure that. So the pendulums, our best people could perform the task in the appropriate amount of time with uh, very few pendulums that were quickly controlled in one second or less or no pendulums. So we created kind of a sliding scale where a one pendulum to one second ratio is acceptable and anything beyond that is not. So an average pendulum over one second is demerit from the score of 10 points for every second after that. So if you had a perfect time score with an average of five seconds, we would count only the four. So uh, 100 minus four times 10 was 40. So we'd get, end up with a total score of 60 after you got your perfect score on the speed and your pendulums were counted in. Collisions, our best people could perform the task with no collision. So demerits are at 5 to 1 for a minor collision, 10 to 1 for medium, and 20 to 1 for major collisions. Alarms, once again, the best people could perform these tasks with no alarms. So tripping an alarm is the same thing as a near miss, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, so we'd be a 10-point demerit for each one of those alarms. So if you have an operator with no pendulums, collisions, or alarms, with a time of 9 minutes, they would score 100. An operator with a perfect time score, but an average of three seconds per pendulum, uh, one minor collision and one alarm, would receive a score of 100 minus 20 minus 5 minus 10, or 65. So trying to gain that speed at the expense of smoothness and safety is not rewarded. So the intent then was to track it and make it something that the managers could look at and easily see where their people scored. And we had guys who thought their people were rock stars, only to find out that maybe they weren't. And after showing them this graph, some of them were saying, well, that explains why the clients have been complaining about this guy. So we plotted the data onto a spreadsheet and produced graphs for them to see. The top graph was a pre-hire for shutdowns employees, and the bottom one was for some of our regular employees. So it's not, not uh, all-inclusive, but it, it does give us a pretty good sample. The average scores for the new hires were 20 to 50, so those would be the blue lines. And the average scores for the new hires, like I said, was 20 to 50 percentile, whereas the average score for our regular employees was in the 50 to 74 percentile. So we can see already the people who've been with us for a while, the people we've kept, actually on an average, are doing much better than those we're bringing in for shutdowns. So what do we do with these results? So there's two areas of concern immediately. How do we ensure that those in the bottom quartile of our existing employees get better? So we identify particular skill sets that are lacking in our current employees, allows us to um, have the supervisors and managers be informed on how to observe and correct those skill sets. We can also make initial corrections in the SIM uh, and then have follow-up by branch manager to ensure those skills uh, shortcomings are corrected. Um, and then if they want, we can also bring them back into the simulator and give them extended training in order to be able to correct those particular behaviors. Quite often, we get guys who've been doing this for 20 years have got one or two bad habits that allow them to score really low. And if we can fix those two bad habits that they've had since they started, they'll make them a much better crane operator. So how do we ensure that new hires meet the same skill level we expect of a regular employee? So the numbers by themselves don't mean anything. If we go back to that one um, slide, you would notice that there's a couple of guys who scored zero. 
So right away, those guys have been flagged for us to say, hey, there's a concern. We don't know whether or not this guy is going to be able to do this shutdown for us because he doesn't seem to exhibit the skill sets we require. So rather than just send him home based on what we do the simulator, we would then test him on paper, check what his knowledge is, and then we would go out in the yard and have one crane that we could actually just test his skill sets on in a safe environment. And on the last shutdown, we actually sent two people home um, that we'd never done before prior to ever hiring them. Uh, and we didn't have the luxury of doing that before. So having the simulator allowed us to do that and prevent that risk from being transferred to our client site. So uh, we're, reg we're required to train our regular employees because they already work for us. New hires are tested on different criteria, so we don't have to, we, there's no obligation for us to train a guy we just hired. Uh, or or we were about to hire, put it that way. So it's much easier for us to test these people before we hire them. If they meet the requirement and we need them tomorrow, we can send them to work. If they don't meet the requirement, then we're going to go on to the next guy. Uh, so currently, we don't have any simulations that match the complexity of our biggest equipment. So in the future, we're, we're working with Vortex and CN Labs um, to be able to create some new cranes that we can use, some that actually match the equipment that we currently use. We're looking for stuff with long booms, long radius, working blind at heights, um, dealing with off-level loads, off-center, center of gravity. And as we help develop those scenarios and cranes, then they will also be available for uh, the rest of the public to use. So we look at the path forward. The big, hairy, audacious goal is in, in an ideal world, every crane company testing facility and hiring hall would assess their operators to exactly the same level with the identical criteria. So that way, if I send an apprentice to work in another branch with a skill level of 60 to 70 percentile, the branch knows what they can expect from that person. If we call the hall and ask for an operator with a skill set of 80 to 100 range we, for a very difficult job, we would get exactly what we asked for. Uh, so this would allow us to assess people accurately and end up with a known and reliable asset. And that's how NCSG uh, does our assessments with our crane operators. Thank you. Great job, Steve. We have one final poll question for you, and then I'm going to open up the question and answer session uh, with anything you all might have. Let's see here. Third poll. All right, we're going to launch that one. What do you think is the biggest potential benefit of simulation-based training? If you want to put your uh, vote in now, we'll hold it open for another 45 seconds. We do have a couple of questions to get us started. If you all think of anything, we'll keep these questions and answers open for 10 minutes or so. And um, if something comes to mind after this poll goes live, we can answer those too. All right, you've got about 10 seconds to vote. I'm liking these polls. <laughs> All right, three, two, one. Let's share these results. Can you all see those? Yeah, yeah. So 42% for uh, better prepare for the unexpected accident scenario. Um, Steve, uh, I know you know you just went through your presentation. You mentioned a lot of uh, ways in which you benefited from the simulator. But if you had to pick just one, uh, which which of these would it be? Um, I, I would sort of that would be between can learn skills faster and objective assessment. For us, like I said, because we can uh, go up and down by as many as a hundred operators in a short period of time. Um, we've had a problem being able to get objective assessments done in a timely fashion um, that would prevent us from putting um, people with, who are unskilled in those high-risk areas. So I would tend to lead towards the objective assessment. And of course, it, may, it would depend on the size of the company. So if you're a smaller company, it's much easier for you to get that objective assessment. But when you've got 200 operators plus, uh, you need to have a method that's a, a little more objective, I think. Excellent. Thank you. Very good. Okay, folks, um, I'm going to go ahead and start asking some questions here and um, get this going. Um, 
Paolo, can the simulators be developed for a specific model? I know Steve mentioned uh, maybe going to some larger cranes. Um, can you kind of explain that a little bit? Uh, certainly. I mean, uh, you know, the simulators can be developed for uh, any type of, uh, of uh, crane and heavy equipment. Uh, right now you have uh, simulators for, um, for mobile cranes, mobile hydraulic cranes, uh, different types of uh, crawler cranes, different, uh, different capacity cranes, uh, tower cranes. Um, there are also simulators for uh, machinery such as uh, drill rigs and concrete pumps. So, uh, you know, essentially any type of, of crane and heavy equipment can actually be developed uh, and offered as a, as a simulation-based uh, training uh, tool. What about smaller equipment like an aerial work platform or a forklift? That too, that too. Um, yeah, that kind of equipment uh, can also be uh, can also be provided. There are simulators available today that uh, that offer training modules for for smaller types of uh, machinery such as aerial plot platforms. Okay. Um, at some time, point in the future, will certification testing be available in a simulator? That might go to a training training company. Well, um, I think that's, uh, that's um, what's available today in uh, simulators used for uh, crane operator uh, training and certification. Within simulators, you can actually practice um, for certification tests. Um, for example, the CIC, uh, Crane Institute Certification, has certain uh, exams that students need to go through before uh, receiving their, their, their certification and, and uh, operator card. Um, within simulators, you can actually practice to uh, to go through those uh, those practical exams, right? But ultimately, the practical exams will have to be used in a piece of equipment, not not a simulator. Uh, well, today, yeah, that's right. Today, um, you still need to do the final practical exam uh, on on the real machine. But uh, you know, we're hoping that in time, uh, as people become more uh, accustomed and uh, you know more familiar with uh, simulation technology, that eventually uh, the simulator would be able to uh, be used for uh, for uh, certification or um, or recertification. I, I would hazard a guess that it's already available, and depending on the jurisdiction, once again, so there's so many jurisdictions out there. I know that within um, the jurisdiction where, where I'm at for tower crane, it's not reasonably practicable to be able to set up a tower crane to do an assessment on somebody. And uh, as part of the apprenticeship program, they have um, opened the door to allow for the final assessment to be done on a simulator. I see. Okay. Um, does the motion system, um, is that important for a simulator? Uh, the comment is because when we add the motion system, it becomes very expensive. Well, um, I can say a little bit about that. And then um, maybe, Steve, I know you have a motion platform on your simulator. You can, you can add to it. But, you know, um, operating a crane, as, as I mentioned in one of my slides, you know, there's a common expression that is, uh, you know, you often operate a crane by the seat of your pants. Um, to effectively operate a crane, you need to feel how it's moving, and um, by adding the motion platform to the simulator, you do give that added realism, and you you, you teach the student effectively to feel how the crane uh, is moving and, and behaving in certain situations. So it, it is an important component, I think, in in uh, in producing effective uh, operators through uh, to simulators. What's the alternative? It's just a well, we kind of. We, we kind of prefer not to have operators operate by the seat of their pants. Uh, that was something that was maybe effective 20 or 30 years ago, but certainly not today. Um, however, that operating and having that feel is very important. So I know that when we have we first got ours, there was a big pushback from guys saying it was just a game. It's not realistic. Of course, they'd never sat in it. And the first time they lifted a load and felt the crane lean forward a little bit or they started to swing and they felt what they would expect to feel when they're operating a real crane. That certainly raises the bar and that level of realism and the acceptance. It doesn't take long for you to get immersed in the, uh, in the experience to start feeling like you actually are running a crane. All right, very good. This is also another question about motion um, in simulators. What are the benefits to those, uh, the learning rate, the abilities for retention? Can you repeat that? What are the, what are the? Um, I'm sorry, they, they wanted your opinion or experience on motion in the simulators, what their benefits are, um, the learning rate, and abilities for retention. 
the learning rates and abilities for retention? Well, uh, I think again, as uh, you know, Steve explained it uh, pretty well. Um, it just adds a level of realism that that leads to uh, you know to better understanding how the crane is moving, how the crane is behaving, and um, you know, I think. Uh, Yeah, sure. that's, uh, that was our experience here at the Institute with our previous simulator. It was a full motion simulator. It just enhances the, the, the it, it, it brings in the human senses of motion. So I, I don't know how you would measure that, but uh, it, it is a definite added value. Okay. I know having, yeah. having sat in the seat when uh, somebody was messing around with the outriggers on me while I was uh, swinging around and suddenly feel the crane start to tilt to the left like I suddenly lost an outrigger. Uh, it's very much a very, your heart is in your throat right away, so it definitely adds a large level of realism. I think as far as the retention aspect of it goes, it's kind of hard to measure um, what that's going to do for retention. I think if you train your people, I think you're going to retain them. What, uh, what percentage of training time can you replace on a real crane um, by using a simulator? Well, what, I, what I've seen in speaking with, in, in, in my experience, uh, some of our customers, typically you can, you can, you can, um, you can reduce uh, time on, an, on the real crane by perhaps, you know, 15 to 25 uh, percent. So, you know, up to a quarter of the, of, of the time on, on real equipment, you can actually attribute to a simulator, and you can cut from use uh, from using on the on real machine. Okay. Um, and final question. This is another about the actual uh, simulator um, monitors. How many monitors is your best choice for a simulator? What what are your well? There, the basic I wouldn't say there's a, there is a. I want to say there is a best choice. It really depends on on budget and, and particular needs. Uh, but you know there are simulators that uh, that have a single display, uh, all the way to simulators with uh, you know up to five, maybe even more displays uh, for a more immersive experience. Um, so it can go from you know one to multiple simulators, uh, multiple displays. Sorry. Okay. All right. Um, I don't think we have any additional questions to ask. It's two o'clock, and uh, we'll wrap this up. But if you have additional questions. You can shoot off uh, an email here to me. Uh, my email address is on the screen, phone number is on the screen, and I can direct those questions to the best person to, to answer them for you. Um, otherwise, this presentation has been recorded. We'll post it on our YouTube channel this afternoon and get that uh, available for you all. And um, again, thank you for attending today. Thank you again to CM Labs and uh, Steve Fryer, Paolo, Jim Headley, and Bill Schofield for your time today. And uh, any additional questions, let us know. Otherwise, have a great week. Thank you very much. Thank you.